Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Tonight on Insight, the profound impact that dental problems have on people's lives. I wouldn't be affectionate, I wouldn't be kissing my partner. It's so much of who a person is, and if they can't smile, it really, it really does take a toll on them. You're 44. How many teeth do you have left now? None. Every tooth kind of chipped away another little part of the personality. There are around half a million people in Australia who needed dental care in the past year who didn't get it because of fear and anxiety. But there are around two million people who needed dental care and didn't get it because of the cost. What were you quoted? Uh, just with the teeth alone uh, would have been just under $5,000 be put to sleep it was about three thousand and could you afford eight thousand oh, dollars to get no. your teeth fixed not at all Saturdays is always our busiest day and it's really important to have a nice smile I mean you're greeting people every day I'm Therese and I'm 53 years old and uh, I'm a real estate agent and work in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Another day, let's see if we can sell some houses. <laughs> and are you looking for yourself or for investment? Uh, for myself. I didn't go to the dentist for over 20 years because of my phobia and my fear of going to the dentist. My teeth became loose, they were rotten, they were massive gaps, I had extreme bad breath, gum disease. You know, I was always having to put my hand over my mouth and when I was talking to people, I kept becoming so self-conscious that, you know, they're not looking or listening to me, they're looking at my mouth. It changed, you know, the way my interaction with my partner was because I didn't want to kiss him. It became even more of a phobia of, of trying to survive day to day and I eventually had to do something about it. But. I, I remember saying to my partner now, I just can't, I can't go, you know, I, I, I need some help. About three years ago, I went through to sleep dentistry, because obviously of my phobia, and basically when I woke up, um, they had removed my teeth, and then within 48 hours, I had, you know, these perfect teeth where I'm, and now I smile at the world. It's just been the best decision of my life, and I'm so grateful I found a way to overcome this and, and be the person that I am today. Therese, when did you start having dental problems? Probably from a child. I, I just don't know what started it, but I had a fear from straight away. You said you didn't go to the dentist for 20 years Correct. because of a phobia. Yeah. Where did that come from? I don't really know, just from childhood. Um, needles, um, I'm really not too sure. I had panic attacks and I couldn't count four times in my life that I'd probably gone to the dentist when I did go. Um, I was shaking, I was gagging, dry reaching, I was sh tears. It was pretty bad. Mm. Yeah. Now, you eventually went to a dentist when you were 40. Correct. What state were your teeth in by the time you were 40? Uh, the beginning of it was I had a, um, a loose tooth at the front and they wanted to do a root canal and, of course, I obviously didn't let them do it. And then from then on, uh, they, they got really bad. By the time I was almost 50, I was looking for a fix because... Um, the gaps were so bad. It was struggling to eat. I couldn't eat. I was just on liquid food at that point. Tiffany had gone with me to the dentist to see if they could glue my teeth together as a short fix. And the dentist that I saw then was really mean. <laughs> In what way? He, he lost his patience because I was frightened. He then told me that I would have to take all my teeth out and be without teeth for three months. And I'm a real estate agent, so... That would be interesting. So I was pretty upset. I think I walked out crying, but, you know. Yeah, what was the dentist like from your point of view, Tiffany? She's not joking. I mean, she was terrified. Uh, I felt like I was the mother that day and um, she was panicking. She just wanted to leave the whole time. I said, it's going to be OK. I've never had problems with dentists. They've always, always been nice. I said, they'll, they're here to help you. It's OK. We sat her in the chair and um, she wanted to leave. And, and what was the dentist like? I was hoping he was going to be understanding, but he wasn't. And I can get it, he's probably someone who's seen this happen a lot, but there was no empathy, it was just, you shouldn't have done this, and was just really rude, and it really didn't help. Um, especially it was hard to get her in the, in the place in the first place, and when the, the dentist isn't really kind or understanding or takes the time to appreciate the fact this is really hard for her, 
and just basically says, your teeth are ruined, you've ruined your face, you need to get them out, end of story. Uh, it really set her back a lot. Why did you choose to get all of your teeth taken out and replaced with implants rather than trying to save the teeth you they still had? They were too had? far gone. I had massive gum disease to the point my, my face was um, swollen. So they were past the point of, of fixing. They were all going to fall out anyway. And were you told there were risks with the procedure that you had? Because yes, it's there's quite always an extreme procedure. Yeah, with sleep dentistry, there's always a little bit of a risk. But but in saying that, I had a risk with the, the decay of my teeth. So I guess you weigh up the risks. Chris, when did you start having problems with your teeth? I was about 17 when I started having trouble. Initially, I copped a little bit of a knock in the mouth and the front teeth. And within about 12 months, the front tooth had started to turn grey and I didn't realise what was happening behind the scenes of it. I eventually went to the dentist and it was a hollow tooth. So they did x-rays. I'd lost my front tooth and the one beside it. Um, much like what was just said, my fear of dentists is terrible. I'd go into the surgery, I'd be shaking like a leaf. So what happened after that? to your teeth. You had an impacted wisdom tooth as well? I did. That's what started the majority of the problems. I had a, a wisdom tooth that was impacted and coming in from the side. Eventually the skin grew back over it so I, I kind of forgot about it until I started getting pains up through my jaw. I eventually went to the dentist and I found out that I needed to have root canal, that the root on the tooth was hooked, but the tooth was also quite severely rotten. So it needed to be surgically removed. It couldn't be done in the chair. From there, I went back and my dentist wasn't available. There was a third year apprentice there. She believed that she could do it in the chair. And she did, and it broke off, get on the cap, and left me with an exposed nerve and all the fleshy part of the wisdom tooth. And she apologised and said, oh, this is going to need surgically removing now. I ended up waiting nearly four months to get into the hospital. And in between that time, I just ended up with infection after infection. The next tooth would go, I could see that they were going. I was eating a caramel one day, a soft piece of caramel, and as I pulled my jaw apart, my tooth was still in it. They were coming so out. So you were losing your teeth one after another? Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a domino effect happening. Why weren't you getting treatment as you were losing those teeth? Why weren't you getting I was them going replaced? to get treatment, but the problem was is they wanted to fix my teeth. They didn't want to take them out. They'd keep on putting a filling in and 12 months later that filling had come out and everything behind it would be rot. So then the tooth would have to go. But that had already started on the next tooth as well which was also happening just beneath the gum line, so I couldn't actually see what was happening. I could only feel it. What was your parents' attitude to looking after teeth? Well, my mother lost her teeth when she was 17, all of her teeth. All of them? Yeah. Um, my father lost his when he was about 24. So they were both quite insistent on my sister and I looking after our teeth. You're 44. How many teeth do you have left now? None. You have no teeth at all? No. And how long have you been like that? Uh, since May last year. I had my last four out last year. And what's that like for you, Chris? It's embarrassing. No, not just for me, but for the people around me. Uh, I think especially for my son. You know, I'm sure people say to him, your dad doesn't have any teeth. And it's a very hard thing to cover. You know, you can... You can try and talk in a certain way, you can put your hand up to your mouth. You can't hide it. It's, it's in everybody's face. So what are you getting done now? Um, absolutely nothing at the moment. Um, I haven't been able to wear dentures because of an oversensitive palate. And every time I try and put false teeth in, I gag and throw up. So my only option is to go for implants, which is quite expensive and that's what I'm working on at the moment, saving up the money for implants. Chanel, you're 36. Um, describe for me the current state of your teeth. Oh, they're gone. They're all gone. I've got about eight or ten left and they're just broken completely. And how does that affect you physically? Apart I don't from leave my house. Um, I don't leave it at all, really. You don't leave home? No. Why? 
sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. It's a big thing for you to actually come here and join us to talk about it. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. Do you want to take a moment? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. How does that affect you physically? Are you in pain? Every day, 24-7. When did your teeth start to deteriorate? Well, when they started getting holes and stuff was when I started having kids. Um, but when the, to this, this state, um, seven years ago when I started on opiate medication for chronic back pain. Mm. And uh, in terms of going to see a dentist, how much have you done like that? As soon as I make the appointment, I sometimes don't even go because I'm that scared. What are you scared of? Them going into any in my mouth. <laughs> um, I don't know what it exactly is, but um, as a kid, I used to get my teeth pulled out with pliers. So I put it down to that myself. Who did that? My father. Your father took <laughs> yeah. your teeth out with pliers? <laughs> yeah, all of us kids, yeah. And what sort of work did you last get done? About a year teeth? ago, I had my teeth, they were all fixed, so I went under um, with the health system. They capped my teeth, uh, took all the teeth out that they couldn't fix, and a year later, my teeth have all gone back to the same. And what do you need done now? Um, I'd say that all of my teeth need to be done again, um, but if I do go in, I would rather get them all pulled out um, so I don't have to worry about a year later uh, coming back and doing the same thing again. Can I ask you to what extent diet has played any part in the state of your <laughs> teeth? Um, well, prior to that, I've, I was all right. I, I was a drinker and uh, I gave up that all of that stuff. But um, after that, my teeth started going downhill. So, But at the moment, I can't eat anything. Um, the only thing that I do eat... Sorry. <laughs> Mm. That's embarrassing. Yeah, are you okay? Oh, the only thing I do eat is um, biscuits dunked in tea so they're soft so I can eat them. And that's all you can eat? Yeah. So, yeah. so you don't eat anything else? No, and I would love to. <laughs> I'd love to have a nice steak. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, that's all I can really eat. I'll, I'll have a mince but it still gets stuck in the holes and still makes pain. Matt, you're a dentist and you're the CEO of the Victorian branch of the Australian Dental Association. What do we know about the state of the nation's teeth? Well, after hearing those stories just now, it's obviously a little bit worse than perhaps most people think. I mean, tooth decay and gum disease are two of the most common diseases that affect Australians out of any disease. About 20% of Australians have gum disease and the latest survey that's just about to come out will probably show us that gum disease is actually increasing. So there's clearly some really significant problems in parts of the community. Only I think around 50% of Australians brush their teeth twice a day. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yep, and, and flossing is very infrequent. So all of the, the things that we want people to do to improve their, their dental health, so to eat well, to brush regularly, to visit the dentist, those good healthy behaviours don't always happen. But that's not always part of the, the problem either. Chanel, when you do go to the dentist, do you go public or private? Uh, so um, when I had my teeth done, it was public dental. And how long do you have to wait for public dental care uh, in your area in Canberra? It would have been up to 12 months that I did wait to go in under to get my teeth done. Um, I've also waited um, through the Aboriginal system, um, Ad Aboriginal medical system. I've been on their waiting list for five years, just over five years, and I still haven't seen their dentist. And Matt, you've done research into waiting lists mm. for public dental care in Victoria. What did you find? Yeah, so, and across the country, the situation is, is pretty dire. There's probably 400 to 500,000 people on waiting lists. In Victoria, the average waiting time is 20 months now, and it's gone up about 70% in the last five years. But there's parts of Victoria where that waiting time is up over 30 months. Uh, and then one of the problems is that after you've been seen, you have to wait 12 months before you go back on the waiting list. So the effective waiting time for a lot of people is getting close to three years. And what can those effects be of waiting? You have people who, who wait on that waiting list for two years or three years. Their oral health deteriorates, then they need to have an emergency appointment. So they get bumped to the front of the queue to have some emergency treatment that makes everyone else wait for longer and their oral health just deteriorates and, and gets worse. And we know that there are really strong links between gum disease and heart disease or diabetes. Uh, and so as, as people's oral health gets worse, their general health gets worse. We've heard some stories about nutrition. So if you can't eat 
well because you've, you're in pain uh, or just because you can't chew, then clearly your, your general health is going to suffer as well. Who's eligible for public dental care? Broadly speaking, most of the states uh, will see all kids up to the age of 12. Some states will see all kids up to the age of 17. And then it's a, usually from an adult perspective, it's pensioner concession card holders or healthcare card holders. It's about, about a third of the population is eligible for public dental care. Does the government cover all the cost of public care? Again, that, that varies. Um, so in some states, uh, patients have to pay a co-payment. Uh, so in Victoria, it's, it's about $30 an appointment up to a maximum of $120. Specialist care would be more, emergency care would be more. Other states, it's, it's completely free. Um, but as we've heard, they won't cover perhaps all of the treatment that's necessary. So, um, you know, in, in Chris's example, where he has trouble with dentures, he has no teeth, clearly he's got a need to have his teeth replaced, it's very unlikely that the public system would go to, to providing implant treatment for him um, because of the cost. Kathleen, you work in the public system in regional New South Wales. Do you think it's working? Um, I think it works on a number of levels. I know that we have um, fairly short waiting lists where we are and I also know that we prioritise patients according to need and there are waiting times, absolutely. So it, it works most of the time. What about for kids? The kids are well catered for. All children in New South Wales are eligible within their local health district to go to see a public clinic um, up to the age of 18. And then CDBS, which is a Commonwealth program, will also capture some other kids that have some eligibility. For and that in. provides how much money for them to get dental care? This, yeah, the CDBS um, provides $1,000 um, within either a private practice or within a public setting. Um, and the parents and family can decide how and when that's spent. Are people using that scheme? Are they using that $1,000 benefit? It's used, utilised about 30% of the time, so there's a gap there. Why? There's, I'm not sure whether it's about it not being widely publicised and helping uh, families to understand how to use it. What sort of dental work doesn't the public system do? So I suppose the public system focuses on medically necessary um, dentistry and preventive care. So the discretionary aspects might be things like braces, that's a bit more limited, and things like implants, again, limited. Crowns, um, what about crowns? what about repairing existing, existing teeth? teeth? I mean, yeah. is it, is, does the public system, is it more inclined to take teeth out than it is to provide things like crowns and so on? Yeah, so I think that um, there's budgetary restraints. That's the reality. There is not enough money to um, to give every person a crown. You have to also evaluate the likely prognosis for a mouth as well. If public can't afford to do things like crowns because yep. the money just isn't there to do it, is it more likely that there'll be an extraction of a tooth because you know it might be a crown or an extraction as the as the options? The, the data would tell us that um, people who access public dental care have more missing teeth, are more likely to have less than 21 teeth, which is sort of a, a benchmark for the ability to function well, um, less than 21 teeth, and it's, it's very difficult to chew food. That's partly because of things like waiting so long for care, so problems get worse and things like extractions become sort of almost more necessary because of the amount of tooth destruction that's occurred for waiting so long. Chanel, you saw a private dentist this yep. year um, to see what it would cost to fix your teeth. What were you quoted? Uh, just for the teeth alone uh, would have been just under $5,000. Uh, but then to be put to sleep as well on top of that was about 3000 And could you afford $8,000 oh, to get no. your teeth fixed? Not at all. Mm. How much did it cost you, Therese, uh, to have all your teeth taken out and replaced? It's the whole thing's probably around about 50000 if you want to... If you want to get the whole thing done, yes. Did you have private health insurance? I did have private health insurance, but it wasn't really much. I think you just get like a $1,000 gap. What I did in my circumstances, I took the equity out of my home and the dentist that I saw had a payment plan. So I did half and half. And with the payment plan, that made it, you know, achievable to make it happen. So $50,000 all up, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. <laughs> but worth it. Carmelo, you're national president of the organisation that represents 
dentists. Why is private dentistry so expensive in Australia? There are a number of factors. Uh, firstly, to run a private practice, it's just another small business. The costs of running the practice uh, include setting up the equipment, um, lease on premises, staff, compliance costs, insurance costs, that sort of thing. And that's simply why it costs what it does. If you're setting up, say, a single chair practice um, with all of the uh, latest equipment, you'd be looking at at least half a million dollars just to set that up. Matt, so if there are huge waiting lists in the public system and the private system is, is expensive, where does that leave people? Well, just, I, I guess, back to the issue of, of costs of dentistry. I think one of, the, one of the key issues there is that for the rest of healthcare, it's heavily subsidised by the government. And so when you go to the doctor, you're paying very little out of pocket because Medicare covers pretty much the bulk of it. But when you go to the dentist, it's not subsidised. For the third of the population that can access the public system, where the waiting lists are really long, it's heavily subsidised. And dentists, as Carmelo has alluded to, dentists are running effectively a small hospital. If you had to pay the full cost of your hospital care when you go into hospital, you'd have exactly the same bill. So that's why it costs so much. Where do we go to from here? I mean, clearly we need to have stronger public investment in our public dental system. But where does that all leave the average person who might not be eligible for public care but hasn't got a lot of disposable income to pay for private care? It leaves them in a very difficult position because they, they need to then make some tough decisions about how, where do they prioritise their oral health um, in order to get treatment done. You operate a mobile dental van. We are treating a mixture of people that can afford treatment as well as those that may be on Centrelink payments. When I talk to the patients about what it means to them, it's invaluable. My life is so, so very different. Um, I'm able to talk freely, talk with confidence. I'm act actually able to hold my head up high. Chris, tell me a little bit more about how your dental problems affect the rest of your life? Uh, I don't leave the house very much. Um, I don't go near anybody. I try to do everything over the telephone when I can or via email so I don't have to come face to face with people. I'm just becoming more and more self-conscious. Every tooth kind of chipped away another little part of the personality, I think. What are you able to eat with no teeth? <laughs> well, the tea and biscuits actually made me laugh because that's one of my favourite things as well. <clears throat> not great dietary. <laughs> it's not, but I've actually worked out something. <laughs> and there are different types of biscuits. So you can have a multi milk if you're not very hungry, but if you're really hungry, you can have a, a Monte Carlo or a Tim Tam. <laughs> Custard creams. What about things so, like soup, though, or, you know, soft food that's a bit Every now and biscuits. then I'll... I'll go for soup or a bit of pasta, but it always ends up in places where it's not supposed to go. You know, your teeth stop food from going in certain places, I guess, and you end up with a bit of mince in a pocket in the back of your tooth, and all of a sudden you've got your finger halfway down your throat. So it's easier just to stay with the food that you know is going to go down without any amount of chewing or any effort whatsoever. So what would you eat mostly? I drink a lot of milk. I drink about two and a half litres of milk a day and that pretty much wipes out the appetite altogether. And then on top of that, I'll just have a, a sandwich or something, something that doesn't require chewing. And how long have you been doing that for? Uh, years. How many years? No, it'd be over 10. Over I used 10 to be a, a fit, healthy person and now I'm down to about 55 kilos. And what about work? How has it affected work? Um, work's probably been the hardest part of it. I, I used to be a, quite an outgoing person and always worked in hospitality, so my face and my voice and everything was very important to my job. Then I eventually ended up going out of hospitality because I didn't feel like I belonged there anymore. What do you do now? Um, next to nothing. Every now and then I'll, I'll clean little old ladies' cars at the retirement village down the road. What sort of comments have you had from people? I do a bit of volunteer work at my son's school and a girl in a younger grade said to me one day, she said, you've got no teeth. And I said, you don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it's more often something innocent like that. And your 11-year-old son, what's it like for him? He doesn't say anything. But I, I know he wears the odd comment. 
I used to work two jobs and worked as a taxi driver for a while and he was picked on just because I was a taxi driver. So the fact that his dad hasn't got teeth, yeah, I I'm sure he wears the odd comment. Tiffany, what did you notice about Mum before she had her teeth fixed? Oh, as a kid, it's, you, you sort of just see the gradual decline and it's really upsetting just to watch your mum not smile anymore and suddenly not want to be in pictures. I guess once your, your teeth start to go, I, I think she sort of developed a mentality, well, I sort of let everything go. And the decline from her teeth was gaining weight, um, a loss in confidence, a, a loss of herself. It was awful. It was really, really upsetting. And you just watch as it happens and you don't really know how to help. Um, but it, it's so much of who a person is. And if they can't smile, it really, it really does take a toll on them. Therese, when your teeth were at their worst, how did it affect your relationship with your partner? I had somebody say to me, you, you know, your breath is so bad, you need to do something about it. So then I became extremely self-conscious about it. And, you know, so I, I wouldn't be affectionate, I wouldn't be kissing my partner. I felt like um, I was losing who I was as a person. I was a pretty passionate kind of person. So I was just becoming very secluded, isolated. Chanel, you talked about what you've been eating. How does that affect your overall general health, the, the situation with your teeth? I've put on a lot of weight since just having biscuits uh, because of all the sugar. Um, I recently seen a doctor about the, my size and I don't think she believed me that I was only eating biscuits. I've been on OptiFast, sort of a meal replacement shake, and it, it just gets boring just having liquid stuff all the time. And what's it like for you when you look in the mirror? I don't. I don't take photos. I don't, like my son will be seven in February and I haven't even had a photo with him. So what does all that mean for your quality of life then? I don't really have one. Not at all. Peter, you're 60. Why did you have problems with your teeth? I started having um, issues with my teeth in my, my 30s due to opiate use. I was using heroin at the time um, and opiate replacement therapy as well, which is methadone. methadone. Yeah. After a number of years of being on methadone, I found my uh, teeth quickly deteriorated. How long were you addicted to drugs? For close to 40 years. And how long did it take for your teeth to deteriorate? Uh, quite rapidly once I'd started on the methadone. It affected my health immensely just due to the fact that um, the constant infections, the constant ulcers. I hear a lot about not being able to eat. That, that became a huge issue for me as my teeth progressively got worse. Um, my diet became progressively uh, very, very limited. It got to the point where um, I'd become so self-conscious of the way I looked, um, the state of my mouth, the way I spoke. I ended up growing a really big bushy beard with a big moustache to hide the fact that I was withdrawn, my mouth was out of whack, you know, um, it hid what teeth I had left in my mouth. By the time you started rehab, yep. what state were your teeth in? Uh, I was missing all my front teeth. The teeth that I did have were 50 to 60 per cent of them were broken off at the gum line. The teeth that were close to whole were partially whole. When did things start to change for you? Um, when I went into rehab and that was about six years ago. I found Windana. My experience of them was not only did they provide me with a, a place to heal and deal with my addiction, but um, with what Windana provided as well was a, a individual healthcare plan. And part of that healthcare plan was their dental um, plan as well. So they are able to help me manage and navigate the dental system. And what did you get done? Over an eight month period, I was able to access um, the community uh, dental programs within the Latrobe Valley. So I was able to get basically all my teeth removed um, and 
then what Windana also provided for me was um, a nutrition based whilst I had no teeth providing me with a diet that still was able to um, provide my body with some form of nutrition. That was would have been over a six month period. And at that time there, the government was a actually provided a, a dental scheme where I would pay partial payment towards dentures and the, and the government would um, make up the rest. So I was able to access that, which again, when Dana was able to help me um, navigate how to do that. So you had an advocate, basically, to help you through the public so. system. How long did it take, that whole process? Uh, it took about 18 months before I got dentures in my mouth and then it, subsequently another six months of my mouth working out how to eat again with dentures. And what's it like for you now? Um, my life is so, so very different. I'm able to talk freely, talk with confidence. I'm ac actually able to hold my head up high. I'm, you know, that, that's just from a confidence base, you know, from a self-esteem um, point Are of view. Are you working? I'm actually working with Windana at the moment. Not only have they been able to provide me with a way out of addiction, but they've also, you know, provided me, you know, health care, training, and now they've linked me back in and I'm actually an employee with the organisation as well. Mm. Kathleen, how often do people get results like that from the public system? I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much you need an advocate, really, to be, yeah, to be organising for you to yeah. get through it. I think it's a great question. I think that it is difficult for people to negotiate that. I say to patients when I see them that we sort of have two doorways. One doorway is, is to get you out of pain and distress or perhaps you've got a traumatised tooth, so there's that pathway, and then we'll ask you to go and, and um, put yourself back on the waiting list. And then there's the general care pathways where, where you do get rehabilitation. So there's kind of, I suppose, a fast lane and a slow lane, but the fast lane only has limited options. Jalal, you're a dentist and you operate a mobile dental van as well as having a private practice in Sydney. Why do you have the van? Well, it's pretty cool, isn't it, to be able to <laughs> deliver... It's huge. To, ..to deliver your skills wherever you can or wherever you want to. And where do you deliver your skills? Some towns in the southwest of Queensland, Kalamulla, Quilby, Thargaminda, Windora, and then we come back down into New South Wales to Burke. So we're um, focusing on expanding in that area, just going to towns where there isn't a dentist, so we're not treading on anybody else's toes and kind of really um, targeting the people that don't have access. What sort of demand is there? Oh, it's, I could spend months in the town if I really could. For a while it was uh, privately operated by me and because I was funding it myself, I needed to be only treating patients that could afford the treatment just so that I could afford to run the service. But we've taken steps to actually turn it into a not-for-profit organisation so that we can be more attractive to receive funding so that we can actually go to a town of 1,200 people, such as Kanamala, and actually sit there for three or four months and sort out the whole town. What sparked this idea for you? I guess that, that cool factor, um, mm. the, the novelty factor. But then you get out to the bush and you really see uh, what issues are at play and it kind of... What do you see? You see a high prevalence of complex uh, dental conditions and you see your gum disease, you see rampant tooth decay, you see a lack of awareness about the importance of diet and oral health, uh, you see healthy foods being very expensive in the local grocery store compared to the higher sugar um, content foods. So the odds are stacked against them in terms of the folk out in the bush because they're also hundreds of kilometres from the nearest dentist. And who are you treating? Now we are treating a mixture of people that can afford treatment, which may be local business owners, cattle station owners, their children. I guess my, myself funding it, but also with some help, we're reaching out to Aboriginal communities as well as those that may be on Centrelink payments that can't afford treatment, but we're providing it for free. When I talk to the patients about what it means to them, it's invaluable. For instance, I'll treat a young mother of three children and I will fix uh, a cavity in her upper right first molar and it might only take me 30, 35 minutes to do. But for me to go to a town of Quilpie and do it for her saves her having to drive 
700 kilometres to Toowoomba and organise care for her children while she's away, as well as the fuel, as well as the time away from work. So all of a sudden, a $170 or a $200 filling actually turned into more than a $1,000 exercise just because of the economic cost of having to leave town. So how much of your time do you spend doing this and how much of your time are you in private practice? So I've been doing this for almost three years now and I spend one week out on the truck and three weeks in Sydney at, um, at my private clinic. But uh, uh, thanks to wifey, we've just had a, a baby girl five months ago. So I've just dialed down the clinical activity on the truck for a little while so I can have my dad hat on. Dentistry is not expensive, a neglect is. Your toothbrush and toothpaste cost actually less than a bottle of sunscreen. What effect did having that work have on you? Absolutely changed my life. I asked the dentist, don't make them look like Hollywood. I want them to look like a 56 year old woman, you know, teeth. Jan, how old were you when you stopped smiling or showing your teeth? <sighs> it started early teens, where uh, the front here, uh, my teeth started to twist around. I had to basically go and get braces, but at the age of 15, you know, my parents weren't prepared to pay for it. Over the years, it has got worse where it ended up being like a hook. I used to get all the comments, you know, you're, you're Dr. Hawke's bride. I've even had people message me privately online saying, you know, about time you get your teeth fixed. And not that you don't want to, you, of course you do, but I've never been in that position financially throughout my life to be able to do it. Shame plays a big factor because people look at you, say, why can't you feel that you're valued enough to go and get your teeth fixed? How did you feel about dentists? Absolutely terrified. Now, you had a difficult situation in a relationship I did. as an adult as well, didn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. So you were in a domestic violence situation at home as years. an adult. To go to the dentist was, you knew it was you were set up for failure. My ex-husband would say, oh, go and get them fixed then. Go on. You knew that it really it was never going to happen because your priority for yourself was always last. There was always something else that was more important. House, car, holiday. When did you decide to do something and why? I finally decided as you're getting older, you know that dental care and your heart is related. My ex-husband died at 41, had a heart attack. It actually was a catalyst for me to start thinking, I need to do something for myself. You got a compensation payout yep. for an incident that occurred where your house was burnt. Yep. And you decided to get your teeth fixed because you had the money. Where did you decide to get that done? I decided to go to Bali. And the reason I went to Bali is uh, friends of ours uh, have a place over there and they go frequently. So uh, I was reassured that, you know, they did good dental care. What did you have done? Well, I had seven uh, crowns put in, my, in the front of my teeth. And it's such a transformation. And so, how did the cost of what you had done there compare to what it would have cost here? So there was like a package that I had um, where it was the uh, seven crowns. I had the plate beforehand uh, for the week. I had teeth whitening, uh, consultation, uh, so it ended up being $4,000 Australian. To get it down here, it would be approximately 12500 And what effect did having that work have on you? Oh, massive. Absolutely changed my life. I mean, my teeth aren't perfect. I still, my bottom teeth are all twisted. I don't care. I'm really happy that my top teeth look great. And I asked the dentist, don't make them look like Hollywood because I don't want that. I want them to look like a 56-year-old woman, you know, teeth. So that way people look at me and go, ah, you've got a lovely smile. <laughs> you know, rather than, oh, you've had your teeth done. Chris, would you think about getting work done out of Australia? I've looked into it and I've thought about it. But, um, 
Yeah, I'm a little bit dubious on the on the hygiene side of things once we start travelling out of Australia. I know our standards are pretty high, so that does concern me. Carmela, why is it so much cheaper to get work done often overseas than it is here? So the labour costs here are far greater than they are in, in those countries. Also, uh, the cost of materials and equipment is far greater here. So um, it's hard to compete, compete with, um, with those sorts of fees. So from that, it's been a springboard um, to a, quite a large dental tourism industry. What we do know is that a lot of people are very happy with what they receive. We also see some disaster cases. The advantage of having it done here is we do have, um, I think, a demonstrated very high quality system of uh, dental care delivery. Um, the other thing too is you've also got the protection of the regulator, which means that if you do have an adverse outcome and if it's something to do with the quality of the treatment provided, then you've got a system that um, you can use to gain some sort of uh, recourse and a correction of whatever issues have arisen. Sonia, you run three private practices in Queensland. You also provide a specialised dental service to women who've experienced domestic violence. Why? There are many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is people like Jane. Um, I have faced violence in my life as well. So I understand the phobia at a deeper level as well. People who have been through violence and abuse they don't need special care dentistry-wise, but they need a special care before you actually start the treatment. Every single person who goes through the abuse or violence, is it's very deep-rooted emotionally, and the biggest loss which they had was the trust. Mm. You have to find ways according to that particular patient or person so that you can trust them. And people say, give back, give back, give back. It's my way of receiving back and healing myself. What sort of practical things do you do with the patient? I have gone to the cafes to meet people where we will sit outside mm. the cafe because with the trauma, memory, how memory works, is it's related to the places. Mm -hmm. Your mouth is your second most private part of the body and that part is open in your lap without any control. And dentistry is a very technical branch. We're, co we're talking about technical stuff. We forget that there is this emotional side mm. to it that you're actually not even acknowledging. And this emotional side is actually very heightened in people who have faced violence and abuse. What sort of things do you see? Things like certain words that will trigger, so certain words where people will say, I don't like my mouth being forced open. I don't like how the water trickles down my throat. I don't like lying flat. They won't look at you. Low self-confidence. They've been told that they're not good enough or they deserve whatever happened to them. They will not look at you when they're talking. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with those people? Um, I'm getting better. That I don't get as emotionally affected as I used to. But one of the biggest thing is listening. They will tell you that this room reminds me of church or this room reminds me of like fear of unknown. And you just sit there and listen. You make sure that if they, they trust you, that you don't break that trust in any sense. And I have been in a situation where things I missed and then they're in that chair and where this whole thing just break out and you just bail out and you say, you know what, we're just going to sit and talk. So I have spent nearly an hour sitting doing nothing, just talking to them. Jan, how much do you think fear has contributed uh, to the dental problems you've had? And I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, it's having that empathy for that situation. Yeah. Carmela, do you think dentists really understand that fear in patients and what does it say about the way that dentistry is practiced? It goes to show that there is probably a lack of training at the undergraduate level um, to, uh, for, for young dentists to learn how to manage and understand the needs of um, some of these fairly complex issues. Mm. Jalal, you wanted to say something. I think steps are being taken as a recent graduate back in 2011 a big component of my courses in university was patient communication and so um, dealing with dental phobias and anxieties was uh, something that we graduated well versed in. Mm. And the other point that I wanted to make was that 
it can be uncomfortable to get your, your teeth checked and cleaned regularly every six months. But the more regularly you do it, mm -hmm. the less there is to clean, which means it's more comfortable and we can pick up problems a lot earlier so that they're cheaper to fix, less uh, painful to fix and everybody's a lot happier. Like I think for a starter, the, the easy way to really um, make a big improvement is if everybody was just entitled to two checkups and cleans every year covered by the government. I think your prevention will go through the roof and that we'd be making a big dent in the whole issue. Matt, you're an economist from the Grattan Institute. You co-authored a report that looked into whether a Medicare-style scheme for dental care in Australia was possible. What did you recommend and why? So we did recommend that the Commonwealth Government create a new Medicare-style uh, scheme that would cover dental care. Um, so the data tells us that there are around half a million people in Australia who needed dental care in the past year who didn't get it because of fear and anxiety. But there are around two million people who needed dental care and didn't get it because of the cost. How much would a scheme like the one that you're proposing cost and where would the money come from? The number we came up with was $5.6 billion a year in extra spending from the Commonwealth Government. We think that that could be paid for through an, a number of ways. Uh, we think first of all introducing a tax on uh, sugar sweetened beverages, so soft drink, could raise somewhere in the region of uh, $500 million a year. We think part of the private health insurance rebate could go towards publicly funded dental care. And the balance could come out of an increase to the Medicare levy. We think something in the order of, of an increase from 2%, as the Medicare levy is at present, to around 2.5%. And that will be consistent with um, what government has done in recent years with funding the NDIS. Carmelo, what do you think of that idea? Our policy supports uh, these sorts of measures. Um, but government has said to us, we're not going to go down that pathway because we just think that um, we're just not prepared to uh, try and raise the revenue that way. And they're not going to spend out of their existing budgets. Now, what we've tried to do is be practical about it and say we need some schemes targeted at treating people who are in disadvantaged groups. So we know the, wealth of the World Health Organisation has very, very good data that shows that a combined strategy, rather than siloing the strategies, means that any scheme um, targeted, say, at uh, good diet, for example, in young children, will translate into better oral health, and you'll also get the benefits with obesity and diabetes, for example. Sonia, I know you have a view about priorities too, the, the priorities people give yes. in their money to. To, yes. Dentistry is not expensive, a neglect is. Cost of fixing is expensive, prevention is not. Your toothbrush and toothpaste cost actually less than a bottle of sunscreen. And somewhere we actually have to draw the line in the sand. Dentistry is not the same how it was 20 years ago. It has changed. There are methods to overcome fear as well. Plus priorities, like I see people, and my heart goes out to them. 17-year-old sitting in my chair, I'm taking four teeth out, got fake nails, fake eyelashes, hair color. How much do we spend every eight weeks on our hairs? So there are cases like that as well. Somewhere we need to take responsibility for our health as well. And we as a professional are here to support you. If one doesn't, second one will. Can I ask some of the people here how they respond to that, Chris? Obviously, if you, if you maintain good oral health when you're younger, it's going to follow through. But what if it's already too late? I mean, what about all the three generations that are still to come forward? What's the help for them? How long before you have any prospect of getting your teeth replaced? Um, so far, I'm looking at a time limit of about 10 years, as far as I know. Why? Well, I'm looking at about 35,000 and I'm unemployed, so I can only save about 2,000 a year. <clears throat> Are dentures an option for you? No, I just gag. <clears throat> I can't. So how much there. do you have already for, for, have you saved money towards yep, getting Yeah, I've got three and a half thousand. I had 5,000, my car blew up and oh. that took that, so then I had to start all over again. Mm. Chanel, do you have any mm. dental appointments scheduled? No, I sent um, about 10 emails out in the last two weeks, um, basically begging private dentists um, to take me in and put me to sleep to get my teeth done. I did offer to pay $200 a week off to them, 
uh, but they all want me to get loans, um, go through easy pay and all of that kind of stuff, and I can't do that. So what are your options then? Um, just not going to get them done, I suppose. <laughs> I don't see myself going into a dentist. That's how much of a phobia I have of that. Therese, have you thought about what might happen in 10 or 15 years' time with I'm very the replacement careful. teeth I'm that you have? I'm very careful to, uh, to abide by my dentist's instructions now. <laughs> so when I decided to have the implants done, they did warn me that the type of teeth they are, that, you know, within 10 or 15 years they may wear and I might have to replace them. So I was aware of the cost, but I weighed up the situation that I was in on my day-to-day -day life to the risks and for me I think I have a very positive story at the end of a really bad situation so for me my, it's transformed my life I'm you know I'm very passionate and affectionate and and happy and smile and I, I love taking selfies apparently now um, <laughs> <laughs> but support has been a big thing and you know making a decision and trying to overcome fear. Peter you remarried fairly recently did you smile in your wedding photos? Oh, I did, and the fact that I was married 18 months ago was a direct result of me um, having new teeth in my mouth and, and being able to be confident and reassured and, and speak without a speech impediment. It's nice to be um, able to actually look at myself in the mirror now and, uh, and be proud of how I look. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and for telling your stories. I know it hasn't been easy for some of you and I really do appreciate it. And that is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking online. And you can also watch a lot of past episodes of Insight on SBS On Demand. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you, everyone. Well done.